All right, the final talk in this session is Fluxed Animation Boundary Method by Alexei Stomachin and Andrew Selly. Uh, Alexei will be giving the talk. All right, thanks for the intro. Uh, my name is Alexei, and I'll be presenting this paper uh, about Fluxed Animated Boundary Method, which we wrote with Andy Selly uh, at uh, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Uh, so I want to start with saying that, uh, you know, that method uh, kind of went, uh, uh, it's, it's closely uh, related to the movie, the production of the movie Moana, uh, where we used it to uh, create full shots such as this one. All right, so when we started on this movie, uh, we knew we were going to have a lot of water. Uh, so we started with writing our own uh, physical-based water simulator. Uh, it's really similar to... Uh, uh, to what Houdini Flip does with some advanced uh, on top of that, but basically the, the idea is the same. Uh, we have the Navier-Stokes equation, which we discretized using particles. We get this physical-based solver, and as long as the uh, input is physical, we can guarantee some realistic physical uh, high-quality output. Now, the problem is that uh, directors oftentimes don't care about real uh, The term we like to use the studio is believability. Uh, sometimes that borderline with magical uh, kind of stuff you see on the on the left, and there's uh, quite a big gap between uh, physically based simulation and our directed result. There are uh, multiple methods you could use to control uh, simulation. Uh, I roughly classify them three categories. There are obviously more more methods, uh, but the main uh, the main uh, criterion to distinguish them by is, is basically how aggressive they are. Uh, so the most aggressive one is uh, velocity override. We basically uh, take a simulation of a frame and try to override the velocities with some uh, pretty fine ones. Uh, animators like to do that a lot because they have full control of fluid simulation, uh, but it kind of de defeats the purpose of the simulation itself because it pretty much en end up animating the whole thing. Then we can take a little bit softer approach. We can use volumetric forces, uh, meaning instead of enforcing velocities uh, on particles Exactly, we introduce some force fields which have some lagged effect. Basically, uh, you know, through inertia, uh, you have a little bit more believable behavior. So it's more on the physics side, less in our direction. Uh, and finally, the, uh, the approach we're actually interested in is using boundary conditions. So the previous two methods are really um, volume-based. So you control all the particles with volume. Boundary conditions is, are more of a sparse uh, a sparse, more, more sparse control mechanism. We just use the boundary to uh, uh, facilitate you know, certain behavior that we want. And uh, we believe that uh, instead of uh, controlling, uh, kind of post-fixing the simulation that seed, so imagine you ran a sim, you're not happy with the results, uh, you try to fix it. We think that's probably not the best way to do it. Better ways to understand what went wrong and try to fix the boundary conditions so that the simulation works fine uh, out of the box. I just want to say we really were inspired by, uh, by this paper by Nielsen Brisson from 2011 uh, because they uh, used boundary uh, condition approach to up-res uh, simulation, use low-resolution simulation to drive high-resolution simulation. Uh, so that was really inspiring for us. And uh, I also want to give a shout-out to the talk that uh, happened this morning. Uh, the Bifrost team uh, gave an overview of their uh, uh, boat-wake pipeline, and uh, it was interesting to hear some ideas how they came from this paper and the development they did. All right, so back to the problem we want to solve. So we had to do a lot of boats uh, or canoes uh, traveling throughout the uh, Pacific, Pacific Ocean. And uh, the ocean's big. There is no hope of simulating the whole thing. And also, we wanted to have certain character of the ocean. We want to be able to control the shape of the waves. It makes an art direction problem. Basically, we have the whole big ocean uh, that's specified by, say, layout department. Uh, and then we would like to simulate, to run the simulation next to the boats in the vicinity of the boats and make sure the simulation matches the character of the ocean. That is a sort of a particular case over a more general problem where we have, say, the whole world uh, filled with some, some substance, something that kind of moves around, uh, maybe obeying some physical laws or maybe has some procedural uh, character to it. And then there's a character traveling through that world, and you'd like to have a localized simulation just around that character so that you run the same in the vicinity of the character and then impose the boundary conditions in such a way that the simulation matches the outside procedural specified world. So getting back to the boat, let's consider a simple example of a boat traveling on a flat ocean, uh, flat, let's say, lake surface. So the boat moves. Uh, the lake is big. We don't want to simulate the whole thing. So we'll try to localize the simulation to some area just around the boat. So how would we do that? A, that's sort of a simple, naive approach would 
you know, say, well, let's, uh, let's put a collision object in there. So sort of create this uh, bathtub around the boat that would, tra that would be traveling with it uh, through, through the ocean, and the water will be splashing inside of it. But if you think about it, so the boat moves, the collision object moves, and that collision object would push in the fluid, creating the moving water uh, that would be going in the, in the direction to the left. And that's not what we want. We want the water to be static, and the boat actually be moving through that water, creating a boat wake. So this is really what we want. Uh, so instead of a collision object, we would like to introduce this primitive called flow boundary. Uh, so the idea here is the following. We would really like to decouple the two concepts that are involved in the setup. We would like to be able to distinguish between the moving shape of the window, of the window seeing what trying to run, uh, to run and, have a, and kind of realize that there is a separate entity, the, the static material that and those are two, two separate things, and they not necessarily should be mixed. So to kind of better explain what I mean here, let's consider the following example. So if we have the velocity of the wind and the velocity material matching, so shape velocity match with material velocity, we get that example I just talked about. We have a, a bathtub moving, and the whole fluid moves, moves with it. But you don't necessarily have to have them the same. Uh, so the shape velocity can be non-zero with material velocity being zero, and you get an example uh, in the middle, where the window moves through the static water. Or it can go uh, more crazy and uh, have them perpendicular to each other or have some different combination. Uh, to give more examples of that, uh, say here we have uh, shape velocity matching the material velocity, so we have a pure collision object moving through the scene. You can have shape being static and material moving, which gives you a source. Uh, then the shape could move, and the material can be static. But that's another kind of source where the fluid gets left behind with zero velocity. Or you can find a combination of those. So one thing I want to point out here is that concept is not really new. Uh, back in the day where uh, particle level sets and uh, Eulerian techniques were more, uh, more popular, uh, there was a natural way to, to impose boundary conditions to create sinks and sources. Uh, but with more, let's say, modern, uh, I guess, flip, uh, approaches with particle-based solutions, uh, that technique uh, sort of got forgotten in favor of more uh, particle-based ways of controlling simulations. So artists are more um, uh, prefer, prefer particle-based uh, control mechanisms. So in, in order to create a source, for example, they would throw a particle in the system. If you want to delete the fluid, they would just delete the particles. So that's, that's a really simple control mechanism, but that sort of downplays the, uh, the effect of the boundary conditions. So that got lost. And we're looking, really, we're looking for, forward to, to bringing that back into a flip simulation. So in order to do that, let's, uh, let's look at the flip solver. Uh, so uh, in flip solver, particle is a primary representation. And then a, um, a simulation step consists of, of the following stages. The particles get rasterized to the grid. Then the, we perform a boundary value solve on the, on the velocity field. We fix the velocities with a projection, or if it's not a fluid sim, it, you know, it could be an NPM sim or any other uh, you know, hybrid Eulerian Lagrangian kind of solver. We perform uh, the boundary solve as well. Uh, and uh, we, we interpolate the result back on the particles. And then the particles get vectored. Now, if you want to introduce some collision object in the scene, you typically will start with some mesh, and then you would rasterize that mesh onto something volumetric that's understandable by, by the volumetric uh, part of the solver. Uh, and that goes into the boundary value solve. So the way it affects the boundary value solve is, is the following. Uh, so typically, we have some region occupied with the fluid. Then the shape of the collision object would dictate whether the boundary conditions get enforced. And the boundary conditions themselves are determined by the velocity of that collision object. Finally, if you want to insert particles or remove them, you would perform a material set update step. So what, how, do we, uh, how do we integrate the flux animated boundaries in our solver? Basically, it happens right here. So instead of collision objects, you would, uh, you would put the flux animated boundary in there. And the only difference is that instead of having one velocity field, you would have two velocity fields. You would have separately a shape and uh, a material velocity. Uh, the only, uh, th there are two steps of the solver that gets affected. One is the boundary value solve, where instead of, um, oops, sorry. So you would use the shape of the, of the, of the fab uh, to still like, um, to still determine where the, where the boundary condition needs to get enforced. But instead of the velocity of, of that shape, you would use the material velocity. And also, uh, the, the fab affects the material set update. We don't just want to throw particles in the system. We want to make sure that happens in volumetric flux. So let me explain how that's done. 
Uh, so imagine here we have a container, uh, the, the purple, uh, uh, in purple I'm showing the, uh, the, the flux animated boundary, which is a window moving through uh, presumably the ocean that's shown in blue, and we have the simulation particles. Uh, now, assume we already did the whole projection step, so the flow is diverging free, now we need to move everything. We want to advect the flux animated boundary, we want to advect the particles. And we also want to perform the necessary seeding. So what we do is, uh, is perform the seeding in a thin layer of the of the flux animated boundary. We use VDBs to represent it. We don't have to see the whole volume, we just see the thin uh, in the boundary. Uh, that, that's good for performance reasons, and uh, typically, you know, the CFL condition helps with, uh, with determining the thickness of that layer. Then uh, the shape of the object gets moved, and also we detect the particles. And finally, we will look at which particles are inside the object or outside, and we'll leave only the ones that are inside. So that's how the seeding is performed. Uh, it, was, it was interesting, so once we, once we implemented that technique, uh, uh, artists immediately put it to good use. They never ceased to surprise us. Uh, there was this character in the, in the movie, um, uh, the, the Ocean. Uh, it, was, it was actually um, a living creature. It kind of had a shape uh, looking like that. And one of the artists took that shape as the, as the shape uh, for, the, for the simulator, and he painted those curves on top of the, on top of the shape and rasterized them to a volume, creating the material velocity field. Uh, and that's the kind of same he was able to achieve right straight out of the box. So that was, that was pretty impressive. And also the same, same but matched. And by the way, that image that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation was done with exactly the same technique. So now let's get back to the window simulation and uh, getting uh, wakes for the canoes. Uh, so what we, what we started with uh, is we hand-drawn uh, a procedural wave, which is shown in red here. So a red line is the procedural uh, wave train on the ocean surface, which would go all the way out of the horizon, and then would use this gray box to specify the window where we'd like to perform a simulation and actually try to recreate uh, the, that we, we would like to get a perfect match between our simulation and that red line. Because the boats are not there, so as long as the waves enter the simulated domain, we hope that they will stay, that they will keep the shape. But that didn't happen, and the reason it didn't happen is because, well, first of all, the shape of the procedural ocean was picked pretty randomly. There was some variation in the sine curve, and the material velocities were painted, uh, I would say, pretty randomly. It was kind of based on some intuition, but it was not physically exact. And, you know, with the physically-based solvers, if you're not feeding in the physically correct input, you can't expect a physically uh, plausible output. And, of course, we could have probably uh, uh, had have our artists working at some more Try to, try to fix those velocities to, to make them more, more plausible so the matching is better. But that was not practical because we had nearly 400 shots uh, in the movie with, with canoes on water, so we had to look for a more, uh, more principled solution uh, to that problem. So we went ahead and did some research. Uh, we found that actually an equation describing a motion of a, of a wave train on the ocean. Uh, Stokes uh, figured it out a long time ago. Uh, so we basically took that, uh, took that equation, it's called, it's called a Stokes wave, uh, Stokes wave train, it has a closed form uh, expression for it. And if we use that to enforce the, uh, the boundary condition, we get a perfect match between simulation and uh, procedural animation. Uh, now, of course, a single Stokes wave is not that interesting. Uh, typically, you would like to see something like a deep water spectrum, like Tesseldorf waves. And um, all those techniques look really fancy on the, on the outside. There are Fourier transforms involved. But if you look closer, all of those are really just a sum of Stokes waves. So right out of the box, we were able to get a perfect match between a procedural uh, deep water spectrum and a simulated result. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out is that if you do want to use a, say, Tesseldorf spectrum to uh, to create a simulation such as that, you need to do extra work for, uh, for computing the velocities and the volume of the fluid. So like I said, uh, there is a Fourier transform involved, uh, but you don't want to keep doing that Fourier transform on every single level uh, of your grid because it gets too expensive. Uh, and uh, you know the velocity actually decays uh, downward into the volume of the fluid and has different exponential decay or for different harmonics. So you do have to do Fourier transform multiple times. But it turns out you can do it, you can uh, take a discrete approach, you can do that Fourier transform and compute those velocities on a few discrete levels, like a zero level and minus one meter and maybe minus two meters, and linear inter interpolate between them. That's not an exact solution, but we found it worked pretty good in practice. Now let's see how the whole boat wake pipeline works. 
We start with the canoe on, on the water, which we get from layout department. So the water here is procedural, it's not interacting with the boat, and the goal is to create a, a wake. We erode the surface around the boat, creating that pool. And also, I'd like to point out that we actually filter out the high-frequency detail because there is no hope of representing those in a simulation if your grid resolution is not really high. And later on, we will apply those high frequencies of displacement in the final render. Then we compute the material velocity field, just like I described before, uh, for, uh, for a sum of Stokes waves. And finally, we get the result. So if you look closely, you can see there's a pretty perfect match between the simulation and the procedural waves on the right uh, from the boat. On the left, you get a little bit of discrepancy, and that's related to the boat actually being present in the sim, because you know we, we, we constructed the whole method in the assumption the boat is not there, and Tesla Lorf waves are also constructing the assumption that there are no collision objects. So as, long as, as soon as you put something in there, it's going to disrupt the surface. So you, don't, you can't expect to get a perfect match. But still, it's, it's pretty close, and we could use a simple, simple blending technique to get rid of that mismatch at, uh, at the meshing stage. Then we'd run a whitewater pass and produce the final render. And here's uh, just a couple more shots from the movie showing how the method works. All right, so sort of like an extra thing I want to talk about, since we kind of got on the whole uh, Stokes wave uh, topic, we were actually really curious to know what happens when the, when the Stokes waves actually reach the uh, shallow waters and how exactly, and can we actually simulate a breaking wave? Can we simulate a breaking, uh, a breaking barrel? So like I said before, uh, if, you, uh, if you specify the, the material velocity correctly, uh, you can produce a traveling Stokes wave. Here in particular, we actually are sitting in the frame of reference of a Stokes wave, and the boundary conditions are specified exactly. That's why we're able to recreate the Stokes wave exactly. Now, there is a, uh, a parameter uh, of a Stokes wave called steepness, uh, which sort of determines the character of the wave. It, it, it's pretty kind of self-explanatory if you look at this. Uh, the steeper you make the wave, the more peaky it becomes. Uh, the dots here represent just the particle we advected uh, using the exact form for the Stokes wave expression. And you can see that beyond certain steepness, uh, the particles go crazy. And what happens there is the actual mathematical solution is not well defined. Uh, it blows up, becomes unstable. Uh, so that's, that's the limit on the plausible waves that you can have. Basically, if the wave goes beyond that limit, it's going gonna, it's gonna to... So we utilize that to create breaking waves. So we'll start with a traveling wave, as I showed before, uh, with, an, with an infinite amount of water below it. Uh, so that would, that was, that's what was defined the boundary conditions. And we swap those boundary conditions for the ones that correspond to the shallow water. And if you do that, uh, the steepness that the wave has actually is the steepness constraint. So that kind of wave is not allowed in the shallow water. It's too high to, to keep traveling. So if you run same with that boundary condition, it's actually going to overturn and break. So that's a 2D illustration. We can do the same thing in 3D, and we can actually vary the parameters. We can vary the boundary condition along the wave, so we can make it break from one side. And here we integrate into one of the shots in the movie. And another one. All right, so to summarize, we introduced this flux animated boundary method, uh, which we found to be really artist friendly, artists found really intuitive. Uh, on one hand, we didn't really uh, invent the concept because it was present in Olarian solvers before, but we did figure out a way how to integrate into existing flip solvers, uh, including efficient particle receding. And we also provided um, several practical uh, flux animated boundaries, such as Stokes waves, including breaking waves. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Please come up to the microphones if you have any questions. I will start. So for the uh, the.
behind the boats, uh, you talked about how there might be some reflections coming going out. Uh, I imagine if, if it's far enough away, it's not a big deal. You can handle it all with blending and damping. Uh, but if it gets too close, uh, you might get these impossible to ignore reflections. Uh, what, are, in your opinion, what what is like the right heuristic for how much based on the simulation and how much space you need and things like this? Uh, that's a good question. So I think like for uh, for our sims, we kind of eyeballed it. We looked at how uh, how far the really weight plane goes and try to big, to make the main big enough so that uh, uh, so discrepancy is not is not is not too big. Also, the other thing that we did, we actually um, uh, so that that cavity in the water it, it had shallower depth on the boundaries, and we used extra damping to uh, to facilitate that blending, even at the simulation stage. So we would actually dampen velocities to the ones with the procedural water to get rid of the mismatch. The artists have drawn those curves around it. Are those curves controlling the uh, the uh, FAB, or are they controlling the uh, material velocity field? So the uh, flux animated boundary is a combination of two things, right? It's uh, it's uh, it's a shape and the material flow field. So the shape was that shape that was that we got from the animation department, that wave kind of sticking out of the water, mm -hmm. right? And then the flow curves represent the material velocity. So they would describe how the material would move with respect to the shape. They were mostly tangential, so you know the water would not splash outside the object too much. But uh, the curves represented the material flow. Uh, a follow-up question. I, I know at the game presentation you said it was different from a velocity field, but in that particular example, how are those curves different from a velocity field type uh, control? I think what was done, uh, the the artist who did it, he actually uh, took tangents mm -hmm. of those curves and then rasterized them into like a VDB volume, and, and that was a material velocity field. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you again for the talk. This is the end of the session. The authors should be up front. <laughs>